no rest for the wicked. Um, we have um, another um, uh, fantastic talk on, on uh, Python in bioinformatics um, by Imogen Wright here. Um, and uh, we are doing a drug resistance. So take it away, Imogen. Thank you very much. Uh, Hi guys, uh, my name is Imogen. Um, I work for a company called Hyrax Biosciences that is a spin-out of the South African National Bioinformatics Institute, actually. And I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about simulating drug resistance um, in HIV uh, using Python. Uh, this is going to be a talk that's hopefully going to be about 50% doing cool things with Python and about 50% a cool thing we did with Python. So um, there'll be some biology. Um, it's actually been really nice having me and Trevor together because his was a really nice segue into mine. And we'll see where we go. Uh, there are going to be four sort of themes. Uh, the first one, if you're a bioinformatician in the room, you're going to have to just set your alarm for five minutes and have a nap because we're going to talk a bit about manipulating DNA with Python. We're then going to do a segue into some straight biology and talk about what HIV drug resistance actually is for a second. We're going to talk about why we want to simulate it on a computer. And then finally, we're going to do the big thing, which is how you simulate it in Python. Uh, this is actually my first PyCon, so I thought I'd be super upfront with you guys and tell, me, tell you what like, I'm hoping you get out of this talk, ideally. Um, I'm first hoping that you'll learn a bit about BioPython. I'm hoping that you'll learn a little bit about computational biology and bioinformatics in general, and it'll maybe pique your interests a little bit. And then this last one um, is super unlikely, um, that you'll develop a burning desire to simulate your own HIV DNA. If you're a bioinformatician, maybe otherwise uh, slightly worrying, actually, if that is what you come away with. Um, but uh, usually for me, um, I come from a software development background. I worked at Amazon back in the Stone Age, but I ended up doing a PhD in bioinformatics, and now I mostly go to biology conferences. So usually people are really interested in the third one, and the first two they don't want to hear about. If I say Python, they just switch off instantly. So it's really nice to come and sort of pretend to still be a developer and come and talk to you guys. So I'm, I'm really excited. So let's start with a bang. That's DNA. Um, it's a double helix. Um, it's a chain of molecules wrapped into a double helix, but it's pretty useless in that form. In order to do anything useful with it, we need to sequence it. So we need to figure out what the sequence of little molecules is wrapped into that double helix. That's what it looks like after you've sequenced it. That's a DNA sequence. It's in a format called FASTA. Um, it has a name, and then it has a string of letters, A, C, G, T. Pretty simple. This particular sequence is the sequence of a gene. It's a code for making a protein. So I think computer scientists are very naturally actually also a little bit biologists. Because if you do enough code, you might be interested in what the code is that makes you. And it's that, give or take. That's what the, the source code of your body looks like. Every letter of the code is a nucleotide. Uh, it's one of the four molecular building blocks of DNA. In the double helix, a letter A will bond to a letter T and the letter C will bond to a letter G. So each one of those little green stripes is actually an A bonded to a T or a C bonded to a G. And that means we can immediately jump straight from this into doing our first little bit of biopython. Um, you have two strands here. We call one the template strand and we call the other one the complement strand. And if you want to do biopython with that, if you say from bio.seq import a sequence, so this is what Trevor was talking about in terms of a sequence object that exists in BioPython, and you go s.complement, it'll give you the complementary sequence for that sequence, which just replaces all the T's with A's and all the C's with G's and vice versa. So you can imagine this was like an extremely taxing program to write for <laughs> the person who invented this. Um, but it's really nice to not have to write this yourself, because if you stuff it up, you're going to be in serious trouble. So it's cool to be able to use this stuff. Just do it really quickly as one command. So, on to a little bit more biology. How this code works, actually, is every three nucleotides codes for one amino acid. So, AGG codes for arginine, which is an amino acid, and its amino acid letter is R. So, they have names, but they also have single letter abbreviations. So, arginine is R. Now, when these amino acids are translated, they're translated in chains. And that chain of amino acids we call a protein. So we have a string of nucleotides that gets translated by your body into a string of amino acids, which is a protein. So that's the whole code of life up there on that slide, give or take. You can also, yeah? Uh, I see that TTT and TTC both come. 
The TTT at the start and the TTC further on, those are both F. Is that Do you a want significant a job? difference? Or? <laughs> That's a, it's a de degenerate code. There are 64 possible codons, but only 20 amino acids. So more than one set of three nucleotides will code for each amino acid. So it's not a completely one-to-one -one mapping. That's a really good question. Um, if you want to do this in uh, Python, so you want to actually get a nucleotide string, and you want to translate it into its amino acid equivalent, it's pretty simple. You read in a DNA sequence, and you just go, translate, please. Now, at this point, I spent a really long time trying to figure out how to translate this into something funny, but there is no O amino acid. So I can't do Python, I can't do PyCon. It was really inconsiderate of them when they invented the code. Um, the closest I got was Pytheric, <laughs> which I thought a little bit about a definition for that, because it's obviously it's not quite Pythonic. And I don't know if you know what a Pyric victory is. A Pyric victory is a victory that by the time you get to the end, um, it's utterly pointless because you've exhausted so much energy. So a Pytheric victory might be the opposite of that, which is when you're really, really excited to get involved in the algorithmic problem, and then you realize you can just import a package instead, <laughs> which um, batteries included, right? Um, so a little bit more biology. Um, Proteins fold into a functional shape, and that functional shape is what makes you, is what makes all life on Earth. That little squiggle is how we represent the functional way that proteins fold. If you're interested in that folded protein, um, a package called bio.pdb will let you play with it, play with the angles, and it's kind of manipulate it a little bit. Um, that's beyond the scope of this talk, but it's super, super interesting, this protein folding world, and there's a bit of it being done in research groups, um, even in Cape Town. Uh, it's very, very good stuff. Um, one more piece of information. Evolution results in random changes in a genetic code. These are mutations, and they change the shape, ultimately, of the protein. So this is how we get different kinds of life, give or take. Um, if you take this TTC uh, codon here, and you change that T to an A, it's going to change the ultimate shape of the protein. And we're going to talk a little bit about a way to quantify that. How do you tell if a protein sequence is mutated? How do you quantify what it means to mutate? So say you have pytheric, my made up word, and you have pyric, and you want to figure out what's changed between them. Um, you want to say like, okay, so clearly this, there's a mutation that's occurred between pytheric and pyric. What is that mutation? What you do is called an alignment, and it's a pretty simple way to say, let's just find the minimum edit distance between these two sequences. Um, there are three kinds of mutations actually represented in this alignment. There's a deletion, which is where amino acids are removed over time. There's a substitution, which is where one amino acid is changed into another one. And there's an insertion, which means an amino acid has been added. So deletion, substitution, insertion, these are the things that can happen to amino acid change that change the way things look, change the way things behave. If you want to do this in Python, um, the simplest way to do it is to use a package called pairwise2 that will give you a pairwise alignment of two amino acid chains, two proteins. Um, it's actually a little bit slow, and in some um, cases it can be a bit inaccurate. Um, a lot of the work that we do at the company actually involves finding fancier and better ways to do this function. Um, there's actually a lot more involved than I've been letting on because it's not just mapping two strings. There's a lot of um, the real biological molecules, and the chances of one mutating into another are different depending on what the molecule actually does. So we spend a lot of time looking at that, and you might be able to guess why later. So now, in the last sort of 10 minutes, we've got the building blocks of life worked out. Let's apply them to an interesting problem. Um, a recent South African study showed that one in two HIV-positive patients who are already taking antiretroviral drugs, so they're already on ARVs, they still have high viral loads. That means just that there's more virus in their body than we'd expect if they were taking their drugs and if their drugs were working. But how do we tell the difference between those two scenarios? How do we tell if it's that someone's not taking their drugs properly or that their drugs aren't working? One way is to ask them, but that's surprisingly ineffective. Um, maybe unsurprisingly ineffective if you've ever done tech support. Um, but, um, but it's often there's a, there's a real power gradient between a doctor and a patient, and often the patient won't admit that they're not taking the drug properly. So we'd really like to find a really practical, on-the-ground way to tell if someone's resistant to the drugs that they're taking. So we want to find a drug resistance test. Not surprisingly, considering my 10-minute preamble, DNA sequencing is the way that you do a drug resistance test. So you take some blood from a patient, you extract and sequence the HIV DNA in that blood, 
You analyze that DNA for drug resistance mutations, so those mutations we were talking about, for ones in that that we know cause drug resistance. And from that, ideally, you get out a report that says this patient can take these drugs and these drugs, but not these drugs. That's the dream. The catch is that these tests are currently pretty costly, and it takes one highly skilled human being to read each result. So it just doesn't scale. We've got 6.8 million HIV positive people in this country. We don't have 6.8 million people to read the tests. Um, so we need to find a way to do it better. Luckily, in about 2009, people started thinking about DNA sequencing a bit differently. And they started building machines to do it at a large scale in an automated way. These are called next generation DNA sequencing machines. Next generation, I mean, you know, what generation is it, but still. Um, and they produce, take in massive amounts of DNA of any kind. And what they'll give you out is massive, massive amounts of data about that DNA. And what that means is that we can scale this whole process of DNA sequencing and drug resistance testing and maybe do it really, really cheaply in a way that we can get it out into communities where it's actually really desperately needed at a price where we can do that. But the only thing that's really standing in our way is we need some way to take this complex, messy, error-prone data that comes off these machines and turn it into something sensible. So we need something that sits in between the machine and a really simple, clear report that a doctor can read. Um, we've spent about the last five years on and off working on this. We launched it in February. It's called Exotype. You can go play with it at exotype.com, and that's kind of what the company builds. We build these, this drug resistance testing software, and we make some claims about it. Um, we want to detect drug resistance if even 1% of the HIV sequences in a sample were drug resistant. Um, we call this 1% the prevalence of the resistance. So it's just the percentage of the HIV in your body that carries resistant mutations. Um, there's a problem with this picture, which is that currently no other genetic test is this accurate. We need to do it for HIV, because if 1% of the HIV in your body is resistant and you take the drugs, that will very quickly become the dominant strain, because it's just the only one that survives. But we don't really have anything to compare it to. So we get to this really, really complicated problem that comes up a lot in systems engineering. How do you test a system is working properly when there's nothing to compare the results to? Um, we can't just do another kind of test and be like, okay, our test's working, it's fine, guys. Um, so immediately what you might jump to is simulate. So you simulate a data set, you have a known result, you run it through, you get the result, happy days. Um, there's a caveat to this, which is simulate very, very carefully. There's a kind of a philosophical problem, which is that there are more things in heaven and earth than are contained in your philosophy. Um, the real world is messier than you can possibly imagine. So we're going to try and do a simulation, but we're going to do it taking into account a lot of the mess that happens in the real world. The first kind of mess is that HIV evolves very quickly. The HIV in the US is not like the HIV in Africa. The dominant subtype differs between regions. Not only between regions, but as I alluded to earlier, within the human body. HIV exists in the body as a population of distinct viruses, and only some of those viruses contain resistant mutations. So those are two problems just from the HIV virus itself. There's another problem with these machines. If you put DNA into a sequencing machine, what it gives you is literally millions of fragments of error-prone DNA sequence reads. So it reads it messily a thousand times rather than reading it correctly once. So we simulate these puzzle pieces and then we rely on Exotype to correctly put the puzzle together. together. To give you an idea of how um, difficult this problem is, I just took a picture of what one of these things look like. Um, if you read from left to right here, those are all nucleotides. And this is an alignment, just like I was talking, talking about before. Every single one of those sequences is supposed to have come from the same DNA molecule. So that's how much noise and mess and error there is in this data. Ideally, what you would want is a box of everything being exactly the same. So obviously, there's some machine learning and some interesting stuff involved in doing this whole process. So what we're going to do is we're going to do three things. We're going to simulate HIV evolution and diversity. We're going to simulate DNA sequencing. And we're going to simulate drug resistance at different prevalences in a sequence sample. And we're going to do it all in about 14 minutes. <laughs> so um, hopefully, if all goes well. Uh, so we're in luck. Because two out of three of these steps, there are already tools that can help us part of the way. So there's a tool called Evolver Gene that can evolve DNA for us. And there's a tool called ART that is a really good simulator, just generally, of the DNA sequencing process. So we went into this project of building this integration test and thought, hang, this is going to be easy. We're just going to combine Evolver Gene with ART. And we're going to combine it with our own little Python read selection tool to get the prevalences, and we'll be totally fine. 
Um, the end result actually looked a little bit more like that. Um, it's like, well, software stories grow in the telling, um, but we've we finally arrived at a pretty good place. So um, let's talk, start with simulating HIV just in the human body. So to start this, we just started by selecting some interesting resistant HIV strains from across the world. So we went onto a website, you can go to a website called lanol.gov, and you can get a whole bunch of HIV sequences of your own, Los Alamos, so not just nuclear bombs, but also HIV, great. Um, <laughs> and uh, they're a fantastic lab, actually. And um, we then take each resistance sequence, and we pair it with a susceptible friend. So for now, we're going to do a very simple experiment, which is just to take one resistant strain and one susceptible strain and mix them together at different prevalences. Obviously, you can think of um, any number of combinations of 10 resistant strains, 20 resistant strains, but for the purposes of a good integration test, we're going to keep it relatively simple for now, as, as simple as we can within the complexities of Hamlet's ghost sitting there and reminding us about more things in heaven and earth. So we're going to start by using the tool Evolver gene to evolve the resistant and susceptible sequences. What this kind of looks like is taking those two sequences for each pair and building a tree of children of those sequences. But there's a bit of a catch to this. So Evolver gene does this for us, but it doesn't care about the drug resistance profile of the sequences it makes. So we need to go and, with BioPython ourselves, go and find the sequences where we no longer have the clear answer of this one is this kind of resistant and this one is this kind of susceptible, and wholesale remove those sequences. We want all the messiness of life, but we want to keep our known result. So we kill a few sequences on the way. And I'll just segue into a little um, Python aside. We use multiprocessing to run this in parallel. Um, multiprocessing is a challenging part of Python sometimes. And one of the most challenging things, which maybe you've seen about it, I'm sure lots of people in this room have come across it, is that Python 2.7 multiprocessing doesn't log stack traces to the screen in child processes. Um, so we borrowed this from Stack Overflow, but I just figured, especially if there are bioinformaticians in the room who are going to try and multiprocess things, it's good, to, it's good to go through this. If you wrap your multiprocessing pool in another class and redefine the function that you use to put processes into your pool by returning the original pool function, but instead of just the function that you give it, wrap it in a class called log exceptions that wraps the caller in a try catch block and passes it back to the head, you can actually get around this whole horrible idea of like there's no stack trace and who knows what's going on, which especially when you're wrapping research code, um, you, need, you need some stack traces, it's very important. Um, so uh, this is uh, definitely not my work, um, Rupert Nash of Stack Overflow for the solution, Python community is amazing, it's the easiest language to Google about as far as I can tell, um, so this is, this is a really cool thing to be able to do. So up until now we've been talking about simulating HIV in the human body. We've got our nice tree of sequences. Now we're going to simulate the next generation sequencing process. So we're going to take this tree of sequences, we're going to stick them all in a box, and we're going to simulate next generation sequencing reads from them. Each of these reads is a short chunk of the original sequence between 200 and 450 nucleotides long. The gene we're targeting is about 3,000 nucleotides long, so it's about 10% of the gene at each time and each one has a random amount of junk in it. So it's got a random amount of insertions, deletions, and substitutions that weren't actually in the original sequence. So we've got to kind of aggregate this somehow in our original drug resistance testing tool, and in this simulation we're testing how well that was aggregated. So just to remind you how messy things are, that's how messy they are. Um, this is what we're getting out of these kinds of tools. So we developed our own Python wrapper for art to generate these reads. Um, we've released it, so I'll, I'll give you some GitHub links at the end. And now we only have one more step to go to get out our samples. We need some resistant sequences and some susceptible sequences, and we need to combine them at different percentages, different prevalences, to get out resistance. Now we started by randomly selecting resistance and susceptible reads in the correct proportion, and we thought that would be absolutely fine, because I mean, obviously that's what the um, machine's doing itself. Um, but we found that actually the wiggle is such that we couldn't fulfill our promise that we're going to look right down to 1% in the reads with our tool. So you might not be able to get 1% in the human body out of the reads, but we still, we have a kind of in-house joke, but we take it very seriously, that we want to always be 10 times as accurate as we need to be, because there are lives on the line. 
And so we decided we were going to make a simulation that was much more accurate than the machine could be, so we could make a tool that was much more accurate than anything the machine could throw at us. So in order to do that, um, you take your resistant and susceptible sequences, and say, just for an example, we want to simulate resistance at 20% prevalence. So we want to say 20% of the HIV sequences in this patient's body, or in these reads particularly, are resistant. And say that in our 3000 base HIV gene over there, there's a drug resistance mutation over here. That very simply means that for this drug resistance mutation, we need to select four susceptible reads that cover for every one resistant read. It's not brain surgery, that gives you 20%. Um, we use a really cool little tool called PySAM, which actually you can plug straight into ART and pauses the kind of key that ART gives you about where the errors were in the simulated reads that you can use then to figure out exactly where they were located. So we include that functionality to try and figure out what exactly it is that we've made. Now in reality the reads don't line up like little soldiers like that, they're all randomized. It looks a lot more like that. So there's a lot more chaos in it than, than you'd uh, maybe like. And the reason that you might not necessarily like that chaos is what happens if very nearby drug resistance mutations block each other from being fulfilled concurrently. Um, if you don't understand what I mean, bear with me for a second. So imagine that that blue line is your HIV gene. And imagine that you just need four reads deep to get the coverage you need for the ratio you need. Usually we say you need like 16,000 susceptible reads and 4,000 resistant reads to get 20% prevalence because the coverage of these things is quite deep. We have a lot of copies before we need to get to our final coverage. So imagine now you want just four reads instead of 16,000. And you have a drug resistance mutation here, and you have another one very nearby, just over there. And now you're going to start selecting some reads. So you select one read, and the coverage over both positions is one. So you're happy. You select another one, it's two, going great. You select a third one, it covers the position on the left, but not the position on the right. But you want this to be as random as possible, so that's fine. You, cover, you put in another read, which again covers both positions, and suddenly you have fulfilled your coverage for the position on the left, but not for the position on the right. Um, and now imagine that you've got this really big data set, but no other read just fulfills the position on the right and not the position on the left. You're basically stuffed. So you have to go, you can just go on and keep simulating until you get exactly the right combination of reads, but the simulation process is actually fairly computationally expensive, so we didn't necessarily want to do that. But we still wanted to get exactly the right amount of coverage at each drug resistance mutation position. So what we did was figured out that, well actually it's this read that's the problem. So what if we could just remove the reads that are causing this blockage and replace them with a read that wouldn't cause a blockage? So that's kind of the process that we've gone through. Um, in Python, it looks pretty simple. You take the drug resistance mutation dictionary, you simulate the selection of the reads, so you kind of know where the blockers are. So you just go and try and get full coverage and figure out where you're going to find blockers. So this is relatively quick. Um, we only want to go through this data. It's got to be order n. It's, it's 50 gigabytes of data, 100 gigabytes of data. We can't be sitting around trying to figure out exactly which reads we should select. So we go through once, simulate the selection, and we then chain together some generators. So we take one generator, which does in real life, but yields, so we're not actually running it yet, the reads that you would have done in the simulation. So the original generator that you first saw. I'll be doing this again with pictures in a second, so don't fret if you don't get it even this time. Um, and then if there are any low coverage uh, positions left in the drug resistance mutation dictionary after your simulation, you find out which um, fulfilled drug resistance mutation positions are blocking the unfulfilled ones. You then chain another generator there. You actually wrap the original generator in a generator that doesn't yield the reads that are causing those blockers. And you then finally chain that to a final uh, generator that adds in reads that will fulfill both the blocking position and the fulfilled position. So to see how that looks, this is the initial generator throwing stuff in, finds the problem. This read, though, actually wouldn't go in in this case, because the other generator would already have taken care of the fact that it's not allowed to go through to the next stage. And then finally, that generator is chained to a final generator that does that step. And we're done, more or less. Um, we take 
10 sequences for every run from Los Alamos. Um, we do now actually for four sequencing platforms, although this only shows three. This is what these machines look like. They're of all different kinds. That one at the top is not used very much anymore, and we've added, we're trying to add new platforms that do DNA sequencing all the time to this. Um, and we're doing it at the moment at nine different prevalence levels. So these are all the prevalences at which you might want to detect HIV drug resistance. Um, because all this takes quite a long time, it's quite computationally expensive, um, we tell it to go via Slack. Um, it talks to CloudFormation, which talks to EC2, which spins up the instance, which does it. When it's done, it punts it all back up into S3, and it tells us it's done via Slack. So um, that has nothing to do with Python, but I'm just quite proud of it. Um, <laughs> um, so you can produce your own samples to do this. You can do it with any resistance profile, any sequencing platform, any drug resistance mutation prevalence you want. Again, I don't, there are probably three or four people in the room who might want to do this one day. Um, you can get, find it all at GitHub. Um, please be kind. Uh, I think that's always, please always be kind in life. <laughs> um, so just a little two minutes on what, where we're going next with this. Um, right now, all we've released is our HIV drug resistance testing platform. So we take in um, HIV DNA sequence data. What comes out is an HIV drug resistance report. And we can also do a little bit of tracking of where HIV drug resistance is spreading in communities as a result of this. Um, we don't want to just stop at HIV, though. This is actually a really general platform. So we're going to try and do it for TB as well. TB is a massive problem in South Africa and worldwide. And for antibiotic resistance, which I don't know what you know about antibiotic resistance, but there was a recent report that came out that said it was going to cause 300 million premature deaths by 2050 if we don't find a way to track it, don't find a way to make better antibiotics. So these are the big problems we're tackling next, and we're going to need to generalize our simulator in order to do that, to so find a way to simulate drug resistance generally. Um, and if that sounds like fun, uh, we have some empty seats at the moment, so do come talk to me afterwards. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Imogen. Fantastic. Um, any questions from the floor? Hello. Um, so there was the one slide near the beginning where it showed the nucleotides mapping to the amino acids. Mm. Um, I was just kind of curious, like this is probably a noob question, but um, how is that evaluated? Is that greedy from the left? Like, oh, I mean, goodness. <laughs> Um, you just asked a very, very complicated question. You mean... Sorry. No, um, no, 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 no. I mean, that's fantastic. Like, it's good that you're thinking about that, because it obviously isn't really that simple. Is it this one you're talking about? Before that... Before? Um, before that, we're, we're actually... Before, that, that one. That one. Okay. Um, so, in the front, there's like TTT, -T -T, and then uh, I think there's like TTG, which maps to L. Like, what happens if you, if you have that, like, is that a telomere cap? Whatever that is. In the front, um, what if there's instead of TTA, there's TTG um, after the after the beginning chunk? Like, how do you know? Yeah, I mean. Okay, I think. Uh, are you asking which? So, am I starting from the first nucleotide or the second one or the third one? Yeah, when you're figuring out which amino acids mm. um, maps to which sections of stuff, like obviously there's going to be collisions. Like, how is that resolved? So that's. A really good question. Um, it's, so what you're talking about is something called a reading frame. So the reading frame of DNA is very, very important. Um, DNA genes usually start with a start codon that says, OK, it's time to start reading now. And then they're read in groups of three until they hit a stop codon. Um, this is actually the beginning of a very big gene that has several coding regions. So um, it's not necessarily so relevant. I'm not actually even sure if this one's coding. <laughs> um, and um, so it's, it's, there's, there are markers in the DNA that the, um, the thing that transcribes the DNA knows what to stick to to start. And that determines what the frame is. Because you can see there are a bunch of frames. And actually, um, Sometimes, so viruses, because they want to be very compact, they get very clever. So they encode different genes in different reading frames of the same sequence, which is, I mean, badass. <laughs> I mean, like, how do you treat those like poly polyglot nucleotides with viruses? Like, do you then have to like evaluate them twice or something? Like, depending on the application. So, luckily, with drug resistance, we're usually only looking for one gene at a time. So, we just go in the reading frame of the gene that we want. 
So you mentioned that the machines um, read the DNA um, a thousand messy times <laughs> instead of one accurate time. So yeah. who's doing the uh, work to create machines that read more accurately to make that would make your work easier? Everybody. Um, so obviously this is this is because this is a very new field. Um, Hopefully these machines will become much more accurate and then we'll be able to take much less data to do the same kinds of results. Even now there's quite a wide variety of kinds of accuracy. Um, obviously I picked the messiest machine to show you that picture. Um, but there's a lot of, of improvements in accuracy of the guys who make the hardware. And as that happens our job becomes easier and easier. Yeah. On the same slide here, mm. um, you get different codes for the same amino acid. Mm -hmm. Do the different codes actually make a difference? <laughs> there are two bind physicians nodding and smiling over there, so I think you get the answer. Um, surprisingly, sometimes they do, yeah. So there, there's, um, it's, it's a much subtler difference than a change in amino acid, but there are different things around the expression of the genes and the way that they work that can be affected by what the underlying code is. And that's actually very new work. It's very interesting stuff. Yeah. So um, you're simulating uh, mutations in the DNA sequences. Mm -hmm. um, how does that actually map to uh, drug resistance? Um, so there is uh, an algorithm that takes each change in amino acid and gives it a score. So say you have, oh, geez, I don't know, an A to G somewhere, right? It'll say, okay, so if there's a G at this position instead of an A, that scores 15. And if we get to 60 as we go along the sequence, and that score is specific to one drug, so each mutation will affect one class of drugs usually. So we add up the scores along the sequence, and if we get to say 60, that's the cutoff and it says that's resistant. And there are very, we don't make those algorithms, there are very smart people at Stanford and other places who make those algorithms. Okay, so I was going to say, like, if it's continually mutating as it's evolving, then surely those need to change over time. I think we're on version 8.1, something along those lines. Hi there. Uh, how frequently are new mutations coming in which uh, form drug-resistant properties? Ooh, I couldn't answer that off the top of my head. Does anyone else in the room want to give it a go? Um, there, there, is a wide there are a ri wide range of strains and a wide range of kinds of drug resistance. HIV evolves very, very quickly, so if you give it a drug, it will f eventually, within the course of a human lifetime, find ways around that drug. So I suppose that's the rate at which drug resistant mutation comes in. It's the rate at which drugs are given to populations. Um, and that's true not just of HIV, but of all drugs, which is why giving routine antibiotics on vast scales to vast numbers of people drives, people, drives drug resistance development, because it's the more chances, the more mutations, the more resistance. Hi. Um, <laughs> how quickly does a does the rate, um, the prevalence rate, um, rise from, from say, 1% to the dominant rate? Good question. Don't know. Not sure if anyone does. Okay. And is there, is there a specific target um, for medical reasons, for example, so you know when to, when to um, change the cocktail? Um, usually at the moment, so if you see drug resistance in a drug resistance test, that's one way you change the cocktail. People also look at high viral loads, if someone's come in and you, you think that they are taking their drugs, so this would be the accurate way to do it. But at the moment in South Africa, because it's still pricey and these new ways are still coming in, people will look at high viral load as the indicator of, okay, we're pretty sure this person's taking their drugs, but they've still got a lot of virus in their body, so maybe this has been going on for a year, maybe we should try something else. That's kind of how it's done. It's done blind now, I suppose, and that's, that's the clue. Hey. Yeah, so um, bioinformatics sounds really interesting. <laughs> so, um, so he's a bioinformatician, just for closest care of it. <laughs> so um, say, you know, I've been listening to this talk and I really wanted to get involved in it. Is it possible for me to, you know, pivot from already having studied computer science and get involved in it? Is there a lot of need for it in this country? <laughs> Lots of opportunities? <laughs> What a man, what a man. <laughs> um, 
So just to give you some background, I s walked into my PhD five years ago on my first day and my supervisor sat me down and went, this is what DNA was, just as I've just done to you. So I came from computer science and a bit of physics. I had no biology background whatsoever. I didn't even do high school biology. Um, there is a huge amount of opportunity. We love developers because they've already got the computing side down and learning the biology, curious, interested people can learn the biology. Um, and there, are, there is a huge, huge need for this. We're advertising all the time. These guys are advertising all the time. Smart, competent um, developers can become bioinformaticians and computational biologists really, really easily. And it's such a, it's such a growing field. This, is, this stuff is the future, like codes for life. Uh, who wouldn't want to get involved in that? I, I, I do remember um, somebody saying once, well, in order to get into bioinformatics, you must either teach a mathematician biology or you must teach a biologist uh, mathematics. And the conclusion at that time was it was easier to teach a biologist mathematics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank heavens for computers, I think, might be the answer to that. <laughs> Niels? Anyone else? Imogen, fantastic talk. Thank you very much. It was Thanks. very interesting.